Welcome to this episode of Talk is Biotech. Great to have you, Sandhya, in the show. Thanks, Guru. Pleasure to be here. Do you want to start with a quick introduction about you? Sure. I'm Sandhya, the CEO and co-founder of Cultivated Meat and Seafood Company headquartered in Singapore called Shiok Meats. Hmm. I'm actually a stem cell scientist by training and education. I have a PhD in stem cell biology, but a couple of years ago decided to sort of uh, divulge into the business side of science. So I was a business development uh, manager for a while at the hmm. Agency for Science, Technology and Research. Also sort of dabbled my foot in different uh, startups. So I started my first company in 2014, which was called a science news website, which was called Biotech in Asia, a science news website. And then did another startup after that for science events and then decided that I want to be an entrepreneur. So started to York Meets with keeping in mind that uh, my skill for stem cell biology and love for food can be put together. Mm -hmm. And it can be put to good use for the environment, animals, and humans. Yeah. Love it. So what is your why? Why did you decide to start this company? I always knew that I had to do something with relationship to science and biotech because that's what I love, eat, and breathe at this point. So stem cells is all that I sort of knew. But around 2014, when I was running my first company, is when I came across cell-based meats or cultured meat or lab-grown meat, which, which it was called that time. And I was just very intrigued. Being a vegetarian by choice, I was very intrigued by this new technology that can make meat without the need to grow full animals and using stem cells. So I sort of got obsessed with it. I went ahead and interviewed other entrepreneurs who were doing this. I looked at the technology, the companies. And I think 2018, it was the right time, the right place to start it. And I said, well, I'm about 33 now. I have uh, quite uh, maybe two decades in front of me where I can like sort of, you know, work to get this on board. Let's sort of do that. And so our mission is to make sure we provide healthy and sustainable meats and seafood to everybody in this world. And it has to start with a very innovative technology. And that's where we are. That's pretty cool. And why did you decide to start with seafoods? Yeah, actually, see, I'm I'm from Asia. I'm from India originally. And then I've been in Singapore for like 14 years now. And what I see people consume a lot here is seafood. We have access to a lot of oceans in Asia. So we are able to get access to seafood. It's extremely nutritious, but also one of the industries that's tainted with a lot of issues. Right. Everything from overuse of antibiotics to wild caught, uh, you know, the issues that they have with the trawlers and bycatch and also just, you know, the slave laborers, human rights issue that are there. So when I started in 2018 and with my co-founder, Kai, we sort of looked at the landscape and we saw a lot of companies were doing beef and chicken, which were from the Western world. Right. We said, let's be very Asian. We are Asian. Let's be very Asian. We're setting this up in Asia. So let's look at something that people love to eat, eat here, which is seafood. And among seafood, they like crustaceans, like shrimp, crab, lobster. And the total market size for this crustaceans alone is about $150 billion. Wow. So I think, you know, huge market, huge issues, but at the same time, well-loved product by everybody. So why not sort of go after that? So, And we also wanted to be unique. We didn't want to, again, do beef or chicken or any of that. So we decided to go after seafood. Yeah. Yeah, it does make sense. And so starting a business and even scaling the business is always challenging. And when you start a bio business, it adds a layer of complexity. What key challenges would you like to highlight that you faced while starting the business and also the scaling now, your R&D manufacturing and eventually the commercialization? Yeah, I think when we started off, we had every issue from, you know, raising funding to hiring the right people to getting lab space. I would say the whole sort of startup ecosystem in Asia is not very biotech friendly. Yes, if you want to start a tech company or an app company, you have a co-working space that you can take or you have an accelerator platform that you can go to. But at least in Singapore and Southeast Asia, when we started, that sort of atmosphere wasn't really available because for biotech, you really need a proper lab space with really expensive equipment that you can't right. afford as an entrepreneur initially. So, you know, we used to take a boat to another island called St. John's Island to do our initial set of work because that's the only place where we got a lab space because it mm -hmm. was the marine institute of, of, of singapore it wasn't easy raising that first hundred thousand or the first ten thousand even 
And I think uh, every challenge that we face, we had people tell us, oh, why did you quit your well-paid jobs? You, you're crazy scientists. Why are you doing this? You should just, you should have just stayed in your government jobs or research jobs. You know, you'll fail. You'll never raise money. What, what is this product lab grown seafood? Who's going to eat it? Who's even bothered about all of this? Right. And then it was just six months from then early 2019, we had just showcased our shrimp dumpling product at an event for tasting and Singapore announces they're going to invest billions of dollars into food tech and sustainable protein. And a year later, they approved the first ever cultured meat product by a US company. So I think it just accelerated from then. And now people say, well, you're in the right time in the right place. You know, Singapore is the place to be. What you did is perfect, great and so on. But I would say that's it. And then COVID definitely hasn't helped it at all. Be it logistics, be it hiring, be it supply chains, being be it fundraising. Everything has just got delayed because of COVID. There's no travel. There's no access to certain things that we need. And just logistics is a nightmare. We are really aiming for a commercial launch next year, mid next mm-hmm. year. And But again, we'll start with a very small product line, you know, initial sort of commercialization. But I would say it'll take about a decade to sort of scale up and go there because we are taking a very expensive technology like stem cell, which is meant for biomedical sciences. And we're putting it in a very widespread industry like food tech where it's commoditized. So you're sitting in the middle trying to make a very expensive niche product into a very inexpensive commodity products. So it requires a bit of cooperation from a lot of partners around the world, be it industry, government, regulators, investors, but it also requires a lot of um, scale up and a lot of understanding of the technology for scale up. So, yeah. Right. That's the challenge with every innovation. Like it takes time to optimize it. Like when Tesla was working on electric car, it was very expensive in the beginning, right? But yes. it takes time to optimize it to really serve the mass. So I, yeah, I'm, I think, I'm confident. Yeah. In, yeah. I think the best example is your smartphone. Who would have thought that we couldn't live with without one, right? Now our smartphone is everything but just a calling device. It is <laughs> the way we communicate. It's the way we make memories by taking pictures. It's that how we watch videos and, you know, we listen to music. Everything is within that palm-sized device. So... Yeah. Right, right. You, you mentioned like watch the video. It reminded me of how I learned about your company first. So I watched uh, your interview with Nas Daily. Yes. So yeah, I think that that was pretty interesting. And that uh, I think a few years ago, lab grown meat was still very early stage industry. Now yes. it feels like, like a mainstream thing. Yeah, I mean, the first time I think I saw the email from Nas, I was like, so he had written to us saying he wants to like cover this. And I thought it was spam. I thought it was not (laughs) even real. And then, you know, I had to go back and really, actually, my reply to that was, um, can you please confirm this is really Nas? (laughs) And is this for real? And he actually got back and he said yes yes it's me let's just do this so it was a surreal experience yeah that's pretty cool i want to double click on your technology so you mentioned stem cell technology so how do you want to walk walk through the whole process like how does it work you extract some cells and like what exactly happens at each steps in layman terms so now if you take a piece of meat or seafood it's generally made of muscle fat connective tissue and blood those are certain main cells that make up the meat that you eat currently as a meat eater or a flexitarian and so you don't essentially need the entire animal to make this piece of meat we have made human organs using stem cells We have used them for transplantation, for therapy, for studies and so on. And so what we essentially do in this technology is we take muscle, fat, connective tissue or whatever type of stem cell that you need to make the meat from the animal initially. But these stem cells have an amazing capacity to keep growing sort of outside of the animal's body as long as you provide them with the right atmosphere, temperature, pressure, humidity, pH, all of that. So we make use of this beautiful um, technology, we sort of exploit it. And we we take these stem cells, we grow them outside the animal's body, and we grow them in l- such large numbers in large stainless steel vessels called bioreactors. Right. Uh, bioreactors are essentially what you might see in a brewery, uh, but except it's brewing beer, it's brewing sort of meats here. So we feed these stels, uh, stem cells with nutrient liquid solutions, like, like feed, like a soup. And it's mostly made up of proteins, carbohydrates, amino acids. I am breaking it down into very simple uh, terms, but uh, you know, we call in science we call it media or medium. Mm-hmm. 
And then uh, once these cells are grown in enough numbers, we initiate a step called differentiation, where we convert these stem cells into the organ or the type of tissue that you want. So be it muscle, so muscle stem cells become muscle, fat stem cells become fat. And at the end of four to six weeks, what you get is minced muscle and fat at this point. We are trying to make structured as well, where we provide the scaffold or the tissue engineering to sort of give them that structure, shape, texture. But for now, we pretty much stick to muscle, uh, minced uh, muscle and fat sort of. And at the end of the day, the final product tastes exactly the same. We don't have to do any manipulation. Nutrition wise is pretty similar in terms of protein content. And we're, we're yet to find out the micronutrient content. But at this point, the macronutrients are pretty similar. So the ultimate piece of meat that you get is exactly what you would have got from a slaughtered animal. But in this right. case, you don't slaughter the animal. So one repeated question we get is, do you, if, do you keep going back to the animals to get the stem cells? Actually, no, because like I said, stem cells have this cap capacity to be stored right. at lower temperatures. And then when you put them in the ambient temperatures, they start growing. You put them back in frozen temperatures, they just sit there and do nothing. So you build something like a stem cell bank much like a starter culture when you make yogurt or sourdough or, you know, that sort of a thing. Yeah. That's pretty cool. So do you extract stem cell or you have to undifferentiate uh, the extracted cells? We, we extract the stem cells itself and that's part, mainly part of our IP. And we, we have tried various methods, but as of now, we sort of stick to the un, undifferentiated stem cells. We collect right. it from the animals and then we build our own stem cell bank. I see. So you, you're extracting this from different type of animals or, okay. Yeah. So different species. So we look at shrimp, crab, lobster, crayfish, but among shrimp, we have different types. So we have the Pacific whitehead, tiger prawns, for example, crab is mud crab, lobster is Boston lobster and different types of species. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Once you have this big cryo bank, yeah. I can, I can see this as a potential business model yes. once it becomes like mainstream. Like For different, sure. yeah. I think if you have to make this mass scale, you have to collaborate with other parties. It's unless you are able to license your technology or sort of work with other parties who can help you reach mass scale. This is not going to, it, it won't make that impact that you need. So definitely right. looking forward to such long-term collaborations. Yeah. Right. In the last few years, like what exactly you have to do to reduce the cost? I heard some of your interviews you talked about $1,000 per kg or $5,000 yeah. per kg. So if I listen to interviews, uh, like with one year gap, I can already see you're reducing the yes. cost. So what yes. exactly you are doing to optimize it and reducing sure. the cost over time? Sure. So when we started, I think we were making it at $10,000 per kilogram. We came down to 5000 in about 18 months. Then we came down to 3500 now we're about 800 to 1000, but we'll be at about $50 in the next six to eight months. And oh. how we're doing this is because 80 to 85% of the entire cost is actually this liquid nutrient media that we feed the cells. And right now, because again, this technology is from the biomedical industry, every ingredient that we use is not meant to be eaten. It's, it's, it's chemical based, it's, it's synthetic and it's pharmaceutical grade. So what we are doing is swapping those pharmaceutical grade ingredients with edible, plant-based, sustainable, food safe and human safe ingredients. So if you are using an amino acid, which is chemical based, we are trying to see if we can find a plant that produces the same amino acid. So can we extract that amino acid and then substitute it? So it does take a couple of years to sort of substitute because every media contains anywhere between 15 to 25 different ingredients. And you can't just swap all the 25 in one go, then the cells would die, they would undergo shock. So it's pretty much you know, high throughput screening of different plant compounds, figuring out what has a match and then figuring out what concentration works, what do your cells like and is it, you know, repeatable? If you use the same ingredient over and over again, are we get this and are we getting the same yield? And also since we are using plant ingredients, we have to make sure it doesn't affect the taste of the meat or the seafood itself. So I would say that's how we've managed to reduce just by swapping out a couple of ingredients over time to get to that from the current 800 to get to that $50, it's going to take us about six to eight months because we're left with the sort of last few ingredients that are a little more expensive and a little more harder to sort of swap. And that's sort of what we're doing at this moment. Yeah. 
Very cool. And when you think about the scalability, do you see preparing this media by yourself? Or you are thinking to continue to rely on big pharma or pharma suppliers? Like, what is the source of this economical, potentially uh, economical media to help you scale your manufacturing? Very good question. So two things there. We cannot rely on the pharma companies because the ingredients we eventually will be using will be plant-based right. and pharma companies won't have access to that. And they really don't know what to do with plant-based ingredients because all of theirs is chemically synthesized. Right. Second is I don't want to be in the business of making media. But when I say that, I say never say never. So maybe I might end up doing that in the future. <laughs> Yeah. But for now, we're definitely, I mean, now we're doing small scales, so we're doing it in-house. But of course, when we get into commercial production, we will be looking for a partner to work with, or we're already in the lookout for a partner to work with to make these large-scale media sort of components for us. And so we can be in the business of making the meat, actually. Yeah. That's pretty cool. So you have these cryo banks to store a different type of stem cell. I, I can see in the future, we will have like marketplace for media, different type of stem cells, like matchmaking, right? Anyone can produce meat, but we are not there yet. But I I think this is clearly a need to produce more reliable media and more economical media. Even in most most lab-grown meat companies, they're still using this bovine serum, right? Mm -hmm. And sources, animals. So it's not technically vegan, but I think we are, it's just a starting point. We will eventually move there. So two things there. Yes, most of the red and white meat companies are still reliant on this fetal bovine serum, which is actually blood slash serum from a fetal calf, which is even more cruel than actually eating beef or pork, I think. But, you know, that's long been used in pharma. And that's one of the key ingredients that all these companies want to swap out of. But that's the most nutritional component of your media. So to find a switch over of that in plants is going to be pretty hard but you know what it's not impossible so that's sort of what they're going after the good thing with seafood is we don't need it so we haven't right. needed it from day one because it's fetal bovine serum and we are doing seafood so it doesn't require but seafood has its own set of challenges very less research on seafood has been done nobody has ever had a stem cell bank for shrimp or any types of seafood so we have had to start from scratch But literally anybody, even you tomorrow wants to start a cell-based beef company, you should be easily able to because there are cells available, there's media available, and you literally can license or buy it and do it. But for seafood, it's it's a clean white board and you start with nothing, literally. So it's a lot of basic research that goes into it as well. Yeah. How, what is the IP? the whole the process or uh, it is some unique technology like what is the real ip here the technology is unique and it is to do with the process itself so everything from the isolation of the stem cells to how do you store them grow them convert them into meat like differentiate them into the meat with into the minced meat is all ip that we own and we're the sort of first to do this ever for crustaceans so we're pretty excited about that but we did decide to file for patent because we want it to be licensable in the future and we don't Mm -hmm. want to keep everything as a trade secret at this point our media components are a trade secret but we'll see how things go if we need to open it up we will at some point when it makes sense that's sort of where we come from and Just on your previous question, you did mention the vegan word. So I think that's been a huge debate whether cultivated meat will be vegan. For me, it's not because Mm -hmm. ultimately the final meat is made up from stem cells. It is animal meat. If you do analysis and DNA studies on it, it will show that it's an animal and it's not it's not a plant source. So I would say it is not vegan, but it is also not we are also not doing this for vegans and vegetarians we're doing it for meat eaters but vegans and vegetarians like me who are pretty excited about sustainable products and they don't eat meat because of ethical reasons are pretty excited about it so i would say that's sort of the mix up of uh, the consumers that we're going after Right. But what you would still say it's cruelty free, right? You're probably sacrificing Correct. Correct. one. Exactly. Or, or I would say less cruelty because I think cruelty free means zero, but I would definitely say less and much less cruelty because 
two things. One thing is if you're doing beef, pork or chicken, you don't have to kill the animal. You can do a biopsy, but it's right. still sort of cruel if you think about it. I mean, you're doing a surgery, but in seafood, unfortunately, we have to take these animals out of water and they don't right. survive. But right. it's four animals compared to the four billion that we kill for human right. beings. So it's right. probably, you know, yeah, nothing. Yeah. So they sacrifice their life for the greater good. I guess so. I guess yeah. so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, now you're, I read somewhere you are setting up your manufacturing facility. So do you want to talk about it? So early stage R&D and what exactly the manufacturing will require? Like do you have yeah. to buy fermenters or do you yeah. need to access specific skills? So yeah. uh, the whole process. Yeah. I would say definitely three stages to any sort of biotech commercialization food tech, right? So first stage was the R&D laboratory scale. Everything is very in like ML or few liters and you're sort of, you know, sieving it out and figuring out what works. Um, so what we did, that that's what we did from 2018 to early last year. But all end of last year, we, we scaled up to a certain level called, we call it the mini plant, a mini manufacturing plant where we scaled up to... 200 and 500 liters. So 50, 200, 500 liters. We've gone one step ahead from R&D, but mm -hmm. not into full-scale manufacturing. So that's currently where we are. And what we are doing next within the next 18 months is to build this large-scale manufacturing plant that will be, I mean, multi multiple thousand liters. And that's sort of the commercial plant that we'll go towards. And of course, beyond that, we're looking to expand commercialization into much larger bioreactors or more numbers of bioreactors. So we're able to produce more and more meat. So yeah, it's it's an interesting, I would say, you know, process of taking a very R&D based technology into manufacturing. A lot of learnings, a lot of mistakes that we make. And but it's pretty interesting to see how the cells behave in large scale and how you can get the yield and how this whole thing will play out in large scale commercialization. Yeah. It's pretty interesting. In one of your interviews, you compared this with brewery. So how you had sea yeah. fermenters making beer, you will see yeah. fermenters to produce your meat as well, your food as well. Yes, that's the idea. The idea is if you're a restaurant owner, you can install this in your restaurant and you pretty much make your own meats. If you're a homeowner, why not have a meat maker at home and you make your own meat and seafood? I mean, everybody's making bread and wine and beer now, so why can't they make their own meats? So that's pretty the cool. idea is that you decentralize the whole food production concept and grow your veggies in your garden and you know i think life comes a full circle so we're sort of going back in time grow your veggies in your garden sustainably grow your meat in your kitchen in a bioreactor and then yeah that's that's sort of the ultimate dream yeah to democratize lab grown meat for sure yeah that's great and so once the manufacturing, you have uh, enough bandwidth to produce it, hopefully the cost is $50 yes. or $100 per kg. That's how you yes. measure it, per kg. So how complicated is the regulatory approval process? Because if you compare with pharma or any biologics, it's, it yeah. takes like years to approve yeah. the efficacy, safety. Here there's no efficacy. Like they don't have therapeutic effect right. just yet, maybe in the future with fortified uh, meat. So, so what exactly is the regulatory approval process? Is it just safety and how, yeah. like what type of test? It's process and safety. So okay. currently Singapore is the only country that has a framework for cultured or cultivated meat. Right. No other country in the world has. And what they've concentrated mainly is in the process. So they do want to know where your cell lines come from. If you've done any genetic modification, you have to, you know, disclose it. What's the type of cell? Where does it come from? Which species? Which animal, for example? And then they want to know what you're feeding in the media to them. And then if you're using a scaffold or tissue engineering, what ingredient are you using? Right. And at each step, they want you to check toxicity, nutrition, and all of this is compared to traditional seafood or meat. So if the nutrition or the protein levels in traditional shrimp is X, they at least expect x minus one or something like that in this so it's uh -huh. not it's not very very different it's not it's not like a y or something so i think it's mostly to do with safety and the process itself they want to see what you use where you use any chemicals that go into the process then in the end step is that chemical still there 
is the chemical removed you know stuff like that so i think that's that's what they're looking after going after and seems like the us the fda is sort of going to start looking at that as well and when we speak to other countries the same topic comes up it's more on right. toxicity safety and nutrition yeah so in the us we do have some commercially available meat alternative they're more plant based yes but they are still in the market like uh, yes. beyond meat you go to yes. any restaurant in san francisco you get beyond yes. burger yes so how is it so like the difference the difference is those are plant based ours right. is cultivated so we do form under fall under a different category so they what they make is vegan it's from plants it's taking plants and make it feel look and taste like meat <laughs> your impossible foods beyond meats and you have so many other brands around the world those really don't need to undergo as much food safety or food regulatory approvals because they are made up from plants that humans have been eating from many 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 years so mm-hmm. it's not like a novel product per se but on the other hand impossible foods use a little bit of biotechnology to create genetically modified hemoglobin to provide yes. that bloody flavor that you uh, that you want from beef that needs to undergo rigorous safety and regulatory because it's a new product plus it's gm on the other hand cultivated meat is extremely new right so nobody's ever eaten it and nobody's i mean not many people have eaten it and nobody's ever eaten it for many 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 years to know the the effects of it per se so that's why it's categorized under novel foods right and the definition of novel foods by regulators is something that hasn't been eaten by human for more than 2 year uh, consecutively for 2 years mm. so that's why we are you know we come under the novel category and i and i agree with regulators being extremely stringent and making sure that you know what we are eating and putting in our mouths is actually absolutely safe so yeah no oh, that's great and once uh, this is approved uh, in singapore uh, do you have to get approval in every country or there's treaty uh, to to approve it for, for now looks like every country separately but we are hoping that some countries will come together um, okay. we have been hearing that New Zealand Australia will work together in in close collaboration with Singapore so like getting an approval in Singapore might mean a fast track in Australia New Zealand we're not sure this is just some talks that are going on we'll see how how things proceed yeah i did not think about it this way like like driverless car right so even yeah. many countries don't have legal structure yes. to approve it so yes. it looks like the cell based a market as facing similar challenges yeah i mean we are also a 6 7 year old industry so we are very right. very young since the first time a stem cell professor in the netherlands showed that he could make one hamburger for 330000 dollars <laughs> yeah. um to where we are now we're over 80 companies making different types of meats and seafood and almost most of us close to commercialization we've made quite a bit of progress in 6 years but there is a long way to go to make that ultimate mark right so the right. industry is very young i think consumers are finally you know coming to know of it they want to be educated they want to eat it they want to taste it and i think we're all slowly getting there so i'm not too worried about the regulatory frameworks i'm sure each country will come forward when the time is right and we're right. already seeing those sort of movements in different countries in different parts of the world yeah yeah no that's super super interesting so so once this is in once you have regulatory approval you what type of business model you are exploring because if you follow the journey of beyond meat they started with restaurants right they did not yeah. target b2c immediately yeah. it was pretty impressive because restaurants have all the preparation yeah. they make sure it tastes well So yes. what business models you are exploring? Very similar to that given the fact that this is so novel again and if you put it on a supermarket shelf I think it's going to be very hard for people to figure out what it is you know right. very hard for marketing very hard to explain what you know educate consumers but you put it in a restaurant you're having the restaurant sort of be your sales channel as well you put it in high end restaurants premium restaurants the menu will actually have a couple of spaces to explain where where the ingredients are from what it is where it's exactly made and so on we're also at the premium price point and also we won't be at the mass scale production for supermarkets we're going to right. be producing very small amounts a couple of you know a couple of 100 kilograms a month to 1000 kilograms a month initially and that means we'll go b um, b2b to c which is via restaurants right. food suppliers from now but eventually the idea is to go b2c and sort of be on that every supermarket shelf and right. people can buy it yeah 
Right. How important is customer education here? Because if I go to a restaurant, I see Beyond Burger, there's already trust established as vegan, as plant-based. So what type of initiatives you have to really uh, make your potential customers feel comfortable? I mean, at the end of the day, consumer is the king or the queen, right? So you know what? You can have a great technology, great product, great business, but if the consumer doesn't like it and they don't adapt it, you have nothing with you. Right. So that means since it's so novel, it is scary for people because they have never imagined their food coming from a bioreactor or from stem cells, right? They, they imagine a huge farm with animals or, you know, packaged and put it in the s- supermarket and so on. So I think consumer education has been key. And I would say a good 30 to 35% of my time goes on that. I wow. mean, it, I'm extremely passionate about that. Be it, you know, speaking at a podcast to speaking in a, uh, in a, in a conference to being in a road show, uh, to speak, speaking to, you know, my friends and relatives and the extended family that I have. I think it's important to educate. You educate one consumer also, that means you educate another 10 because that person will go speak right. to 10 people at least, right? So that's sort of how you do it. Our website is pretty, you know, filled with a lot of information. We have an FAQ page that talks about all the doubts that consumers have asked us, you know, is it safe? Is it like plant-based meats? When will it be available? How do you make it? Uh, What goes into it? What's the nutrition of it? And stuff like that. So I would say consumer education is so, so important. And we'll keep continuing it till this becomes mass scale. It's it's never going to stop with the consumer education side. And the most excited generation is the future generation. So the millennials, the Gen Zs, they're, they're super excited for the possibilities of these products. Yeah. Totally. Totally. And I, what I realize is the new generation is more aware about yes. more ethical ways, more sustainable ways. And most often biotech has the answer for that. Yes. Agreed. Yeah. So uh, if you have to see this whole cell-based industry, so we like lab-grown meat, lab-grown, now we are producing milk in the lab. Like, where do you see this industry heading in five, 10 years? Like, where do you see the future of meat industry? I mean, the next five years is going to be pretty crucial for us where we prove that our technologies are scalable and we're, we're definitely going to see those 80 existing companies not be 80 in five years, right? We're right. going to see much less companies because we are, unfortunately we'll see some companies dying because, you know, funding or technology didn't move forward, or we're going to see some mergers and acquisitions, huge ones. And we're going to see those top 10 that will survive and get through that wave and prove that they can scale up and get those products onto consumer plates. I would say the five to eight years after that is going to be for those 10, 20 companies to prove that, hey, you, you know what, we can take a 10% market share of the meat and seafood industry. We've, we've displaced the existing seafood and meat industry. And I would say one common sentiment that a lot of us in this field have, I'm speaking for other entrepreneurs in this field, is we, we don't want to put meat companies or seafood companies out of business. The idea right. is, hey, guys, you know meat and seafood the best. You know how to sell it. You know which is great and all of that. But instead of using, you know, instead of growing meat the way you do currently, why don't you do it our way? You know, we're giving, we are empowering them with a newer technology. Right. So that they can start using their existing land and talent for making meats and seafood our way instead of making it the other way, which is the current way. So right. I think I think I would say in the ne- like after five years from now is going to be that huge rise in sort of scale up and huge scale ma- manufacturing and making that perfect mark where the news is going to say, you know, cultivated meat has taken 10, 15 percent of the current meat market. So, yeah. That's very exciting. Looking forward to that future. Do you see this traditional meat producers will diversify their portfolio by acquiring uh, smaller players in this industry or even start their own R&D initiatives and maybe 10% of their commercialized meat is more lab grown or innovative product? All of that is already happening. So Uh we've seen the, you know, US's largest meat producer, Tyson, invested in companies like us so they've invested in us they've invested in other cultivated chicken and beef companies they've set aside if i'm not wrong 20 percent of their existing land to grow plants for plant-based meats and a certain percentage of that to scale up cultivated meats 
We recently saw the Spain's largest meat company, JBS, just acquire another cell-based uh, meat company. Yeah. We see Cargill investing in this. We see the big, big meat players, Thai Union, investing in this. We have a seafood, Vietnam's largest seafood producer invest in us as well. So we're already seeing those strides. I think for a very traditional company, it's going to be hard for them to innovate internally. So I think the way they are doing is it either investing or M&As or sort of, you know, buying shares into our businesses and placing their bets so that we sort of become part of their long story, you know, right. sort of their legacy as well. Yeah. Right. No, it does make sense to de-risk it because I'm pretty sure the lab grown meat will start taking some market share sooner yeah. or later. Cool. So it's really impressive what you have done and super excited about the future. And last yeah. question I always ask is what advice you have for aspiring entrepreneurs or early stage entrepreneur in this space. Yeah. I interviewed a few uh, YC companies. They are producing yeah. uh, meat in the lab. They are producing yeah. milk in the lab. So what advice you have for these early stage uh, founders? I mean, if you've already started, please go for it and please collaborate. But if you are yet to start, I'm being very honest about this. Don't start another meat or seafood company, but start a company that can support us. Like start a media development company, start a bioreactor production company, start a scaffold company, start a supply chain company, you know, for ingredients for us, you know, be one of those ancillary companies that really are needed when we right. go large scale, because right now we are making headway on the technology. But one of my biggest worries per se, or what keeps me up at night is tomorrow when I'm growing my meats in a 10,000 liter bioreactor, who's going to make the media for me? Who's going to, <laughs> yeah. you know, who's going to make the bioreactor for me, first of all, right. if I want multiples of it? So I would say if they're newer and they want to start something in this industry, they should start one of these ancillary companies. I think the big money is there, the big impact is there, and they have a lot, lot of room right now to improve on capex, on equipment, on media, on scaffolds, and so on. Yeah. No, that's a great advice. That's what's happening even in the bioprinting and 3D yeah. printing space, right? So now you have these companies producing ink of different types. Yes. Yes. So, so I think in this industry, we do need more yeah. suppliers to yes. a more supportive role, producing ingred- ingredients, uh, supporting the supply chain supporting with technology. So that's a great advice. Sandhya, it was a pleasure speaking to you. I really appreciate your time and I will talk to you soon. Great. Sounds good. Thanks, Guru. Talk to you soon. Bye.